if you look at the progression, we did a world plan in 2009 that was more detailed in 2011. At the same time, we did a kind of U.S. plan of a whole without states in 2011. But then we did the New York in 2013, California, and Washington State, and then expanded to all 50 states. Is there a template yet for that that someone or you or others have can provide to towns to give to give them or citizens to sort of say the first thing you need to know is know what your carbon footprint is and then this is how you could get it? It's hard. I can, it's because each one it does take a lot of information and you know and you have to get into the politics of an individual town or city to really like want to craft something really fine. I mean you really have to focus on that town or city as a full-time job. The pleasant surprises or costs have continuously come down of wind, solar, batteries, electric vehicles, and I mean, even, you know, heat pumps are, I mean, because if you think of what you need to transition, there's five things you need, to electrify everything, use heat pumps, use electric cars, electrify industry, so that's like arc furnaces, dielectric heaters, resistance heaters, everything running on electricity. And then efficiency. That's so that, that basically covers everything. <laughs> it's really weird. I mean you can have on your on your hand you have five fingers and each one of them count if you can just solve each one of those things. Right. You solve you solve our, everything for all energy. I mean that's all energy you can solve. And so the technologies are there. Uh, the momentum has gone even stronger. There's this huge groundswell I mean, just there's just all these groups that are there literally a hundred nonprofits that are behind, you know, this hundred percent movement, and you need people. I mean, you can have all the technology you want or all the ideas, but less people are behind it. Yeah, go anywhere. So, so I've learned that that it's really important. It's really combining we combine like business and culture and science and community, and those things together really were what brought kind of the, the scientific part to a larger scale. And so it was it was definitely like a group effort to get it you know into into the mainstream. Yeah. But you know and you know when we started this, well the, our first plan before the solutions project started, Mark DeLuke and I um did that first plan in the Scientific American and everybody said I mean it was like totally panned. I mean they said this is pie in the sky. It's, you know, you're just dreaming, you're just like never it's never gonna happen. And I'm not saying it's happening yet, but I was saying before they were saying like, okay, you, utilities will never want more than 20% of renewables on the grid ever. And now it's like whether you can do 80% versus 100%. So that's quite a change in the goalpost, which I, I'm pretty happy to see. Um, but it's, you know, there's still barriers. It's just, you know, there's still the, you know, all these groups are not going to, you know, don't want it because they're, they're the fossil fuel interests are not going to want to change just because they have this interest in it. Yeah. You know, they're practical issues people always will raise, but I don't think those should be used as reasons not to pursue it. Like you might, like even this proposal to get everything done by 2030. Okay. Even if you don't think you can get it done by 2030, doesn't mean you shouldn't try to get it done. Or, you know, it could be 2035, it could be 2037 or whatever the year is. You know, you don't want to go 98% of the way to the moon. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, but, it's, but I think because there's so many benefits, I'm just looking, you know, just the health benefits, the climate benefits, and the cost of energy benefits now, and the energy security benefits, more distributed energy, people owning their own power, uh, less terrorism risk of distributed energy, and you know, have to go searching for oil in different countries. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know, in job, in course of job creation, uh, it just seems, well, then having, you know, knowing you can do it at the personal level, and then there are all these community choice aggregation utilities, that's another thing that's cropped up. Is there like six, seven states now? Actually, I have a list of them here. New York is one, but California, Illinois, Ohio, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Jersey. So all those states uh, allow community choice aggregation utilities where the utility can actually seek out the 100% renewable power. And then you, any individual can 
can purchase that power instead of their fossil fuel carrier. And so there are a lot of these have sprung up all over the place. And you know, so if people don't actually have to put solar on their roof, right? They can buy their you know 100% renewables pretty much at the same cost. It's you know within the percent. And and that's that example you had tweeted about that or that I saw in upstate New York actually. Yeah. Yeah, that was one that they were. That's exactly what they were doing. Right. They were opting into a community choice aggregation utility. Um, on, on the kind of on the challenge side, uh, I think even David Roberts at, at Vox wrote uh, about the transportation side of things being really tougher. A tough knot. Does that still feel like um, more inertial than would be on the path that would be required? I, I mean, let me just give you an example. I always temper any enthusiasm I had when I when I see a story about purchases of EVs by reminding myself that the Ford F one fifty pickup truck remains the most popular vehicle in America. You know, yeah. so it's like you can't look at one without looking at the other. It's my way of kind of having a cold shower. Right. So I, I don't know. Is, does that feel the same way? Is transportation harder, or or is it just a different way of solving the problem? Well, actually, I think it's easier, but I think it's. I mean, technically, it's easier because if you think about it, the average lifetime of a vehicle is like 15 years. Yeah, years. But so that means if everybody bought a new vehicle today, you know, 15 years or whatever, you, you would turn over the entire vehicle fleet. And we have vehicles, so in theory, you could do it. So that that part is easy. But I have the same problem. Like, like China last year, they sold 1.1 million electric vehicles. You think, oh my God, that's amazing. But then they sold a total of 25 million <laughs> vehicles. <laughs> it's encouraging. The costs have come down, and they're becoming more widespread, and so there's less, you know, anxiety, fear of range anxiety, and things like that. But yeah, you need to ramp everything up on an order of magnitude scale. And that's one good thing about that I like about this fervor of the Green New Deal. I mean, they're just, you know, they're not mincing words. We're not doing the uh, slow transition, all of the above, because things that don't actually work, you know, slow us down kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. That's, we're actually, you know, they're just focusing on what works and saying we got to do it and just, just everybody else get out of the way. We're doing. <laughs> I mean, you can't do it just everybody else get out of the way. You have to kind of work with people. But, um, but you need. I mean, most people do not understand the magnitude of what the change need that you need. And so, when you have a technology that, you know, especially the magnitude of a climate problem that you need to solve eighty percent of it in twelve years. You, and you, so you can't use technologies that aren't going to be available for 15 years, and that's the because it just won't help. It won't. When you spend all that money in the meantime, what things you could have spent the money on. So there's this kind of. It's really good. I think they help to focus on that issue that you need to do things quickly in a short period of time on a massive scale. I find it hard to see the logic and not including extending lifetimes of reliable nuclear power plants as much as is feasible and reasonable in particular communities as part of this. And it also has that potential to divide folks who might otherwise be more amenable to joining in the plan. But what's your take on that? I mean, I'm willing to look at the nuclear case by case. So, you know, if there's a, if there's a plant that's running, that's running at, you know, it's not being subsidized, and it's running at um, reasonable, reasonable cost. You know, that's not a priority for me to, you know, jump on and say, "Oh, we need to close that plant." Like, but I do think, like, you know, like the case of Diablo Canyon. I mean, that was gonna, that required by law they required to replace the cooling towers. Yeah. They had to replace these cooling towers, and they they got bids for the cooling towers between eight and fourteen billion dollars. <laughs> that was just for the cooling towers, not to mention all the other upgrades they needed. Yeah. And you have people who are saying, well, we should spend that money on this nuclear plant because it's zero carbon. And I go, well, why don't you see how much that actually, I mean, that's not, that's, you don't even, that's just an estimate. You know, for everything nuclear, whatever the estimate is, you've got to double it. <laughs> you can do a simple back of the envelope calculation with that number and you can say, well, we could, re we could replace the entire thing with renewable energy at even lower cost, so you can put more up and save more carbon. And 
you, because you're going to have to replace the nuclear anyway, let's say in 10 years or 15 years, right. you have to spend that money anyway. Why spend the subsidy on them when you could, that's basically money that's going to nothing extra. Anyway, the, so it's a case by case basis. And that's the same thing with those three upstate plants in New York. They spent $27 billion or something to subsidize them. So, but there are others that maybe, you know, maybe they're just running fine and they're not. So I would, I'm not like, I, I don't have it. It's not like people think I'm biased against nuclear because I always rail against it, but it's because of, I'm looking at this. This is something that doesn't help as much. It helps, but it doesn't help as much as some other things. 